All right, let's go. So good morning, everyone. Today we're going to be talking about smart materials and what makes them so smart. We're going to start off with piezoelectricity. Don't worry if you're not familiar with the term. We're going to go into it a little bit. So for today's class, we're going to start off reviewing circuits. What we've been doing over the course of the past week, we're going to do a little introduction to piezoelectricity, go into some applications. Where is piezoelectricity being used right now? And a little activity. What are some advantages and disadvantages of this technology? As with many different types of technology we've been talking about, it's a double-edged sword. And then we'll wrap it up. So over the course of the past week, we've been building circuits using these concepts we've learned in electricity. So what are some co components that we've used in our circuits? Amisha. Houston. Pastor. Vivek. Um, we've used Good. Eric. LEDs. Perfect. Amisha. Light bulbs. Light bulbs. And Houston. Batteries. Batteries. Great. So now we're going to use another type of component in our circuit, and it's going to use piezoelectricity. Now let's break down piezoelectricity first. Piezoelectricity can break it into two components. We've got piezo, which is from the Greek root piezin, which means to press, and electricity, which is from the Latin root electrum. To press is a mechanical motion if I'm pressing on an object. Ele electrum means amber, and as we've used in induction. Amber is one of the materials that was originally used to transfer electrons between materials. So what is a piezoelectric material? It's a material which converts electrical energy to mechanical energy and vice versa. This is a type of transducer. And a transducer is what's going to allow us go f to transfer from electrical energy to mechanical energy. So if I start off using electrical energy, this transducer will allow me to end up in mechanical energy and vice versa. So what does it mean that I'm transferring between two forms of energy? It means that if I apply a mechanical stress to an object by pressing on it or bending it, it will give us an out, it will output an electrical signal or a voltage. Now, piezoelectric materials are typically metallic ceramics with a molecular compound consisting of lead, zirconium, and titanium, which is why they're shortened to PZTs. As you can see, we have a force being applied to this material. The force is oscillating, and as you can see, the voltmeter, the output signal, is vibrating, is oscillating. There's a direct relationship between the force applied on the material and the voltage signal that's being output. Now, let's, so we have this piezoelectric material. But how do we make a piezoelectric material? Well, first thing you're going to do is you're going to heat this material above the Curie temperature. Materials have dipoles, which are in different directions. These dipoles are designated with vectors, which have force and which have magnitude and direction. And they designate the electric field in that section of that material. When, if you remember from chemistry, if you heat an object and apply, uh, apply heat to an object, the molecules begin to vibrate faster and faster, which is going to allow them to have a little bit of wiggle room. Then you're going to apply an electric field to this material, and all of those dipoles of the electric fields will align to the applied electric field. And then you'll end up with 
a piezoelectric material with dipoles in a similar direction. But how does that relate to converting mechanical energy to electrical energy? This is going to be your piezoelectric material, which we just created, as you saw in the last slide. If you compress that material, those dipoles are not going to be in that direction which you designated when you made that material. So there's going to be a charge concentration on either side of the material. That same process is going to happen if you expand that material. So we've been talking about what piezoelectricity is. Let's take a look at where it is used today in our daily lives. Let's, here are some devices which utilize piezoelectricity. Let's start in the top left-hand corner, a watch. A watch has a quartz crystal, and that quartz crystal mechanically oscillates. The shape deforms at a constant frequency. That deformation is transduced, the mechanical energy is transduced into an electrical energy or an electrical signal, which helps the watch keep time. And an another device are headphones, something you use, probably use all the time. If you look closely at speakers while they're playing your favorite song, you may notice that they vibrate. In a lot of cases, this incorporates piezoelectricity. The electrical signal, electrical energy, is transmitted along the wires. When it reaches the piezoelectric material at the base of the speaker, it is converted into mechanical energy or deformation. Another device that uses piezoelectricity is a printer. If you look at the base of your ink cartridge, you notice that there's a circuit. This circuit has a piezoelectric device in it. When an electrical signal is transmitted through the printer to this circuit, the piezoelectric material deforms, causing the nozzle to deflect and deposit a little bit of ink. In that case, it transduces the electrical energy from the electrical signal into mechanical energy shown by the deformation. And finally, a barbecue lighter. That takes the mechanical energy from your fingers pressing the button to light the lighter. That causes the piezoelectric material underneath the button to deflect, which generates an electrical signal, electrical energy and creates a spark which lights your lighter fluid and creates a flame so you can have some barbecue chicken. But let's look at other ways piezoelectric materials are used. Researchers are constantly trying to incorporate this material to push the limits of where and how it can be used in the future. Let's take a look at robotic insects. They're bio-inspired. Bio-inspired means that they're taking motion, which naturally occurs, and mimicking that motion. In this case, they're taking a motion which we do every day, from the time we wake up to the time we go to bed, without even thinking about it. Walking. Walking is an oscillatory motion, meaning it repeats itself. And this repetitive motion, piezoelectric materials are good at reproducing, as shown by the headphones. In this case, it's very small scale. You can see it's only three and a half inches by two inches. So it's very small, it's only 50 grams. Let's take a look at this video. You see this robot walking very slowly at first. And it increases its speed with each trial. The researchers are able to adjust the speed of the legs which allows it more flexibility and adaptability to different situations. If you look closely, you notice that there's an electric wire that leaves the robotic insect. This is where the electrical signal is sent to the robotic insect. The electrical energy is transduced into mechanical energy. Let's look at another video on that. In this case, the robotic insect is moving a across a more rugged terrain. It's an uneven surface. Just another way to show that this is a very adaptable object. 
Let's take another look at another project. In this case, instead of taking electrical energy and transducing it into mechanical energy, we're doing the opposite. We're taking mechanical energy and converting it to, into electrical energy in the Samsung keyboard. If you look closely in the top left-hand corner, there's a flexible keyboard. It's pulled back so you can see what's underneath it. Underneath it are piezoelectric devices. Those are the little round things, the little round devices. You're taking the mechanical motion, the mechanical energy, from tapping your keyboard. Tapping your keyboard, because the piezoelectric device is right underneath the key, adds pressure to the device. And if we remember from earlier in the lesson, adding pressure or deformation will generate an electrical signal. You can see this electrical signal in the video by the red LED that lights up. When the LED lights up, it's giving you a visualization that it is generating electrical energy. When he's not typing, there's no LED lighting up. But when he does type, the LED lights up. This could also be incorporated not only for a keyboard, but for a cell phone. If you got into a bad car accident and, you had, and your cell phone battery died, you could furiously type on your cell phone generating some charge. So you have enough energy to dial 911. Let's take another look. Here's another project which is working on harvesting energy. It's the Aeroelastic Energy Harvesting Project. Let's break it down the words. Aeroelastic. Aero. If you look at the English spelling of the word airplane, it's aeroplane. It's a plane flying through the air. Air is a form of fluid. Elastic would mean you're using a material that can be e easily flexed or bent. In energy harvesting, we're taking mechanical energy and we're transducing it into electrical energy using piezoelectric materials. Let's put that back, all back together. Aeroelastic energy harvesting. We're using a flexible material to generate electricity from a fluid. It, this is also bio-inspired, similar to the robotic insects. Instead of looking at walking, though, we're looking at how fish swim through the water. Water's another fluid, just like air is. When a fish swims, it contracts muscles on either side of its body, causing the tail to switch back and forth, which generates propulsion, moving the fish forward through the water, or the fluid. So the fish is exerting work on the fluid to propel it forward. Now, but what we want to do is we want the fluid to exert work on the fish or device. And this, here's our device. We call it the flapper. This airfoil clamp acts as the head of the fish. And the airfoil wing is going to act as a tail. This metal beam, very thin, very flexible metal beam, is similar to the body of the fish. And it has piezoelectric devices fixed to both sides of it. This means that when the fluid flows over this device from the airfoil clamp to the airfoil wing, the airfoil wing is downstream of the airfoil clamp, the piezoelectric device will deflect. Let's watch a video on that. When the device deflects, it will take that mechanical energy of that motion and transduce it or convert it into electrical energy. This is a wind tunnel test. As you can see in the wind tunnel test, the air is flowing from the front or the airfoil clamp towards the airfoil wing. And it's, swish the, it's moving back and forth. It looks like the airfoil wing is swishing back and forth similar to a fish's tail. Let's look at another project. The cyborg moths. This says a cyborg sentinels. If you look at the Oxford English Dictionary, a sentinel is a soldier or a guard that keeps watch. So we want our 
moths to keep watch or perform spy missions or surveillance. Another term you may not be familiar with is MAVs. MAV is a micro aerial vehicle. In this case, that's our moths. We want to outfit these moths with electronics so it can perform these spy missions. But when you outfit something with electronics, you need to power these electronics. And moths aren't that big. They do, these are larger. They have a 10 centimeter wingspan, but they still can't hold that much weight. They don't have a high payload. So we need something that's very lightweight and a small scale. Batteries are very heavy for their size and the power that they produce. And solar panels would need a constant supply of sunlight, which isn't always possible. So researchers turn to piezoelectric materials for a lightweight and reliable source of energy. It may look that a like a moth flies straight, but it's not a very, it's not a smooth motion. When the moth lifts its wing, the base, the body of the moth drops a little bit. And when the wings uh, move downward, they produce a force against the air, thrust. This lifts the body. So they have a cyclic up and down motion during their flight. Small, but it's still not smooth in a straight line. Researchers look to harvest energy from that cyclic motion. Let's look at how the device is on the moth. Here's the moth, the base, the body of the moth, and on it you see two metal beams, very small, very flexible. The piezoelectric device is fixed to the bottom beam. If you look at the beginning of the video, a researcher is flicking that beam, and an LED lights up. This is similar to the Samsung keyboard project. They use an LED to demonstrate or illustrate that ener they're harvesting energy. The mechanical energy from the cyclic motion of the moth during flight is converted into an electrical energy, which would be used to charge the electrical components on the moth. But what if you wanted to get more information besides just surveillance? Now we turn to lab on a bird. This is an environmental sentinel. So we're guarding or keeping watch on pieces of the environment. Traditionally, birds are outfitted with tracking devices. But these tracking devices have a wide range, low precision. So you have a wide range of where this bird could be during its migration. We want more precise information. And we want to wirelessly transmit it to the ground. Where is this bird while it migrates? But not only that, let's find out information about the pollution of the environment that the bird is flying through. Or let's get some information on the physiology of the bird. What's the heart rate of the bird during flight, during takeoff, while it's just sitting still? How has it changed? So one of the benefits of using a bird instead of a moth is a bird is a larger creature when it's flying. It can hold a larger payload, more weight on its back. But if it's a larger animal, it can also cr generate more energy. On the bottom left hand corner, you see this backpack that was placed on the back of a bird. This beam, similar to that in the moth, has a piezoelectric device on it. This beam is allowed to flex while the bird is in flight. And in the middle picture, you see this backpack on the bird itself. This experimental setup shows, mimics the motion of the bird during flight, the up and down motion caused by the wings flapping up and down. Halfway through the video, you notice that this beam was locked into place. Let me show you that again. This was done so that we have a control in our experiment. We want to see how the bird flies without anything on its back, how the bird flies when there's just a dead mass or a dead weight on the, its back, and how does the bird fly when we allow that beam to deflect. Can you imagine walking to class 
and all of a sudden your backpack starts vibrating, you may start walking a little differently. And if that affects the motion of the bird while it's flying, you may not get very accurate data. You may have a large error. And if you're monitoring the physiology of this animal, of the bird, you may not have an accurate sense of what is happening, how the heart rate's changing. This first video shows the bird flying with the beam locked. And let's show you the second video when the beam's unlocked. The bird flies very similarly in both situations, which means that even though there's a backpack on the back of this bird, it doesn't adjust its flight, so you can get accurate information. Here's a piezoelectric device. When I tap it, the, it will deform and generate an electrical signal. This signal will get transferred through the wires, and it will end up lighting up an LED. Throughout this lesson, we've talked about different applications of piezoelectric devices. So what do you think are some advantages and disadvantages of using a piezoelectric device in motion, in converting mechanical energy into electrical energy? Eric. You can make them very small. So as you notice, everything we saw, every single project we saw was at a very small scale. Amisha. The brittle, so they'd be easy to break. Houston. Which project did you see that the frequency was varied? The robotic insect. It started off, when the video started, the legs were oscillating. They were vibrating at a very slow frequency. But at each different take, the frequency was increased. What's another advantage or disadvantage, you think? would be in using a piezo. How, did they look like they were heavy? We put them on a bird and a moth. Would they weigh a lot? No. Probably not much. <laughs> so those are all great ideas. I like where you guys were going with that. Let's take a look at what I had in mind. We hit that they're all small scale. Most projects, every project we saw, used very small, lightweight devices. As we saw in the robotic insect, it was possible to change the frequency of the legs. They're, they can be brittle. But one thing we didn't hit is that energy loss occurs. Not all of the mechanical energy is going to get transmitted into electrical energy there's going to be some loss. It's not 100% efficient. I'm Elizabeth Vanderhoff here at Cornell University. Thank you for joining us for today's lesson on piezoelectricity, one of the many forms of smart materials.